yeah, welcome back. And as usual, I want to start by asking you what you remember from last time. So anything that you remember? What did we talk about? What got stuck? Nothing? Goals. Somebody found the title of the lecture. Since we talked about goals, anything else you remember? I just rem I remember the activity that we had for the education admission. Uh -huh. uh, there were like different hierarchies of uh, uh, how from the top level goals, how these uh, uh, go level by level until we reach the model. Right. And, uh, how to create measures for each of those. Right, so we talked about that there's typically kind of some organizational goal that's the end goal, right? Often make money um, if you're nonprofit, maybe some others. And then you have things that you can actually measure more regularly, um, break it down maybe into leading indicators. Um, uh, user outcomes were goals or some measurements more from a user perspective and model properties kind of at the bottom are things that we can actually measure about the problem. Uh, model and what we wanted was some sort of traceability right so when we set goals for the entire system or, or for component itself we want some sort of traceability that whatever we are measuring we kind of know has some benefits uh, toward our mission right the thing that we want to achieve with the system and then also what Giacqua says uh, we wanted to talk about what we talked about when to use machine learning right so a little bit of characteristic what kind of problems this was useful for um, and we talked a little bit about the business case um, as well right so today I want to move on kind of along similar lines so if you have some goals that we want to reach um, there are a couple of decisions that flow into making decisions about what modeling technique to use, how to use it, what to optimize for. And traditionally, this is often just accuracy, but I kind of want to push a little bit beyond accuracy and talk about what are all these other qualities that we might care about. And um, yeah, we'll see how far we get. Um, as a case study, I want to talk about um, a system like lane assist. Uh, this I think is a picture from a Tesla, um, but a lot of cars, also non-Tesla cars these days have some features. Um, I think some of them are supposed to become mandatory in a year or two, um, where it detects whether you're in the lane uh, when you're driving, right? So if you're swerving to the side and you're not using your indicators, it will beep at you that it detects that you're leaving the lane. Uh, some cars will go a step further and they will steer for you, right? If you're not using the indicators, you can even take the hands off the wheel, more or less, you're probably not supposed to, but it kind of stays in the lane, even if, if you go around a corner, kind of a white corner on a highway, it would stay in the lane. So these kind of systems have been around for a while. Right, so they used to have less autonomy. They might just beep at you when they detect that you're uh, leaving a lane. And the more modern systems will actually steer for you. Okay. So I wanna talk a little bit about what, does it, what kind of techniques will we use to build this system. Uh, maybe just by show of hands, you can do this on the camera. Who has used um, kind of automated steering system or something like this before? Oh, so a bunch of you. It, the automatic steering kind of, to me, feels kind of dangerous when driving, um, kind of oversteers a little bit, as my impression, at least with the rental cars that I've used it on. Um, but yeah, so this is, this, is, this is available in a lot of cars. Does anybody know how these work internally? Leo, you wanna share? So, so the, so there are a couple of different uh, implementations from different companies, uh, but essentially what works is they have either one camera uh, at the center of their, their dashboard, the, the front window, the front windscreen, or two, uh, two separate cameras 
uh, near the low end that are scanning for uh, the lane lines and mostly done by computer vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is they're using a radar. A, a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a long distance radar to, to uh, tracking the car in front of you as well uh, in case the lane gets too wide or the lane lines are missing at certain points. Uh, basically using those as the main inputs and different implementations are adding uh, additional features to make it work better or smoother. Um, but essentially that's how it works. Yeah. So I, I'm not an expert in these, but I think the, these vision systems have been around for a while. So screenshots that you see here are kind of um, image transformations that applied to search for lines in images. They have been around since I think the late eighties. Um, some of those, so you can apply them to an image. It tries to detect the lines. So you're trying to find uh, lines in a certain angle in a certain area kind of to find this. And more recently, the more, more recent systems use a lot of deep neural networks as well in machine learning, where they're trained on a bunch of images and they try to detect those lines. Um, Right. Um, so there's a bunch of these systems around. We want to talk about them a little bit later, right? So, and often they're integrated in a bunch of other things. So there's not just one machine learning component. There's one for the vision system. There's probably one that does the steering. There might be one that detects the distance to another car, right? And I want to go step back for a second and talk about quality. So some of you have heard this spiel and I don't want to go into too much detail about this. Um, but we want to talk about different quality attributes here. So accuracy is one of them, accuracy of a model. The size of a model might be another one, right? Good models might be smaller, for example. But there's lots of different notions of qualities and lots of things that we can measure. And if you step back for a second, quality is actually a concept that can be really hard to capture. So on the left here, I have some pictures and is this a high quality picture? Is this a low quality picture? Right, so the, those paintings, are those, what, what makes this, uh, the quality here, right? And on the right, there's a car, does somebody recognize? I think a Lamborghini, I don't remember, or Ferrari. It's something that I found. Go for it, if you know it. Okay. Um, so, and again, is this a high quality car? How, how do we make this distinction, right? Um, high quality from what perspective? And there are actually many different notions of quality. And again, I don't wanna I just run through this quickly. So there's this transcendent the notion, experiential notion, something is great and we just know it when we see it. Right? So when we see those paintings, maybe they're great because we experience them as great. We can't really say, measure why they're great, but maybe they are, maybe these are not, I, I don't know. Um, this was a one royalty free picture of paintings I could find. Um, then there's product based um, metrics. So maybe the car is great because it has more horsepower than a different car, right? So we can just pick a certain metric and because it has more of that, it's better. Maybe the painting is better because it has more paint on the canvas, right? Um, then there's a user view. So somebody might like a car more because it is faster. It brings them from A to B, right? It's useful. Um, but you can also have a value-based view with, where you contrast this with the cost, right? So the car might be useful, but it's super expensive. So in terms of money spent, is this really good quality, good value. And then you can also look at how it was produced. Was this great quality, right? So lots of different views of quality here. And we could go further. There are lots of different quality metrics. Um, but we can also think about some machine learning component, the vision system or the steering system that has a bunch of qualities, right? So there's a quality of the product itself. How well does it perform? things like accuracy, reliability, security. There's also the project attributes of the larger project of delivering that component or delivering the entire system, like time to market, development cost, research cost, and design attributes. Um, so things that influence, how, not directly qualities, but uh, what kind of problem we are solving and so on. So there are a bunch of qualities, and one reason why this is interesting is that, or 
attributes is that we have certain constraints. Whenever we design a system, we can't just pick arbitrarily among all possible solutions, but we have constraints that we shouldn't exceed. Right? So for example, whatever prediction we are doing in this uh, lane detection mechanism, it must run in real time. Right? So if we are processing 50 camera images a second, we have 1 50th of a second to, to give an answer, and that's a hard constraint. Right? We can't really change that. We can't be slower than that. So whatever solution we are, uh, the entire space of possible solutions we can restrict by saying that we need to be faster in the response time than that. Right? There might also be below a certain accuracy, it makes no sense. Or be beyond a certain file size, if we need a terabyte a deep neural network on a car, probably we won't, don't want to update this. Maybe there might be certain constraints, hardware resources, and so on, right? So there are all possible solutions, and then there's a the space of um, acceptable solutions that we might care about. So I kind of already talked about this, so, well, but we have different kinds of constraints, right? So we have problem constraints, so things, there's a certain minimal quality that we need to deliver. Um, there are project constraints. The project needs to be done or stay in a certain budget, or we have a certain number of people who can do something like this. And then design constraints, what kind, how might the solution look like? So I already mentioned one or two constraints for the lane assist thing, right? So it needs to work in real time. So the inference time needs to perform in a certain time, right? So we have one fifties of a second to detect the lanes. Um, what other constraints can you think of in this specific project? If we want to build this, um, what else? And we want to pick a machine learning algorithm or the component, what constrains our space? What are hard requirements that we can't, um, can't change? So reliability, there's a certain form of reliability. It can't crash all the time, right? So for every picture that we give, we want a prediction probably. Um, at least reliability maybe in that sense. What else? The compute powder power has to fit in a car. Yep. So we have certain hardware restrictions. It should not cause a collision and kind of lane drift. Those are very high level requirements. Uh, probably as goals. Um, you might want to need, you might need to kind of map this back for the solution. What are the specific requirements here, right? So it should not cause a collision, maybe in terms of accuracy. Um, Although we haven't really talked about collision problems of this one, like staying in the lane, you typically have a, comb a combination with kind of detecting the car in front of you. Um, so latency, um, what else? Um, so I'm not really thinking about kind of end user requirements here, right? So I'm thinking about if we pick a, a specific machine learning model or a specific solution, we design the machine learning component to detect, are we going straight? Are we going in a corner? How far away are we from the lane? Um, and we want to decide, do we do deep neural networks? Do we do decision trees? Do we do um, some hard coding? What constraints are our solution, right? So we have hardware constraints, right? We have timing requirements, we have maybe reliability requirements, maybe we need to know about the confidence level, maybe we need to be able to train this with a certain number of training examples, right? So we can't expect a million training examples, it needs to work with a thousand. I'm not sure that that's particularly realistic in this case, but yes, somebody needs to label this potentially. Um, Anything else you can think of? So let's, let's look at this from a different point. So, um, picking the right modeling technique, the right machine learning technique, we want to look at different qualities. And 
I already pushed this narrative that quality isn't everything a bit, right? Um, and I want to talk really today about the different kind of qualities that we might care about. And I want to start by collecting a list of all the things that you can think about that we might care about, right? So the learning process, the model that we learned, and oops, um, let's see. I want to just collect things, right? And I think we can start with accuracy um, as maybe the more obvious thing. Um, then we had already latency or um, inference time, right? How long it takes to make a single prediction. Um, we had some sort of reliability. Um, maybe that's whether it crashes or not. We have memory consumption or um, kind of CPU use, which relates to inference time, what else? Confidence of predictions. Model size. Um, speed of model updates. So I can think of this as two different. So we have a training size and whether we can learn incrementally. Probably, right? So, and how long this takes. Um, what would usability for a machine learning model mean? Enemy? From the, from the point of view of, of users, so how it is easy to use the, the system, whether or not it is, it is, it is uh, easy or not. So that's probably, if we take the system view, right? So we design the user interface and we kind of yeah. select the forcefulness of the model or things, things like this, yes. Um, today, I wanna to stay mostly much closer to the modeling technique, right? So we have, we learn a function and we kind of want to predict the outcome for that function. Um, understandability is typically called interpretability. Interpretability or explainability, right? Um, modu modularity or kind of changeability, whether you can adopt it or retrain it. Um, ability to handle edge cases. Um, not sure how to describe this more concisely. Yes. Maybe robustness, generalizable, yeah. Available, okay. Shouldn't type so much during lecture. Um, anything else? Something like the, a problem in the model shouldn't cause the function of the car to stop working. So are you thinking like a crash isolation? Like if, if you have a buffer overflow in the model or kind of run out of memory? Yeah, something like that. Um, it could affect, I mean, the chance of it affecting a critical function like brakes or the engine management is probably very low, mm -hmm. but um, you know, it might affect the navigation or something, uh, other software based in the car. Okay. So. Bok, what do you mean by transparency? Uh, I actually refers to something like explainability. Okay. Cause, you know, yeah, for, for some cases we don't want um, a method that you, you don't know how it generates the results. Yep, yep. So, if we want to detect um, lane markings in a car, what are the more important features and what's maybe less important? Right, so kind of for detecting just the vision system that gets a picture and detects um, lane markings. Which of these things in my list here is important? I suspect we care about accuracy. We often do, right? Um, inference time is really important here uh, because it's real time. Generalizability, right? So this kind of accuracy, but maybe also kind of corner cases. Does it work in different settings? How robust is it maybe? We haven't actually talked about robustness. 
Um, right, so how easy it is, is it to attack? Um, whereas maybe incremental learning or training time, did I not write down training time? Uh, um, training time is maybe less important. In a car, we don't have a supercomputer in a car, but we also don't need to worry about the smallest embedded system probably, right? So um, that's something that's maybe not the most important thing here. So we can kind of think about some of these qualities are more important than others. So let's say we're not predicting lane markings, but we're predicting whether somebody is going to default on a loan. So we're doing credit, um, predict, credit rating. Right, so kind of somebody applies for a credit card and we want to figure out should we approve it or not. Which qualities are important now and which are less important? So explainability, definitely. Accuracy, probably. Um, reliability and generalizability, I kind of have a hard time kind of framing those really, right? So reliability typically in kind of classic software engineering means it doesn't crash. Um, kind of it produces of what tolerant i um, not so sure with the credit card prediction if the website shows algorithm, you just ask again, right? Um, incremental learning, actually in both cases, we didn't talk about training time is maybe not the most important thing. If, it, if you, these models don't change daily probably, right? So you don't need to constantly learn a new model. Um, so, Explainability, I think, is much more important in this case, right? If you tell somebody that your card application was declined, can you tell them why, right? Or if, if, if a manager needs to look over this, maybe wants to overrule a decision, can they understand why a decision was made? Um, the number of features is actually also very different in this case. Um, this might be another thing to consider. Um, some approaches can handle much larger sets of features. If we look at self-drive or at image problems, we typically have each pixel as a feature, right? So this is, this is a very different requirement than having kind of credit history and a few, few uh, properties of a user. Um, inference time is clearly not that much important here, right? So if, we, if, we, if it takes five minutes to check credit rating, which it probably doesn't, it wouldn't probably be a big deal. Uh, the model size is probably, we're not shipping this on a computer, it can run on a server somewhere. So it's something that we worry less about, right? Training size and training time, probably less important. Um, an aspect that we haven't talked about is fairness, um, right? So in, in kind of um, this situation, you want to be careful about not discriminating as certain people. Vivek? I had a question about uh, how do you identify more on the concerns of security. So we, I mean, like uh, we read about the adversarial attacks mm -hmm. and things like that. So I don't know if they come under robustness or security. Mostly robustness at the model level. So security and safety, you typically want to think about more at the level of, um, of the system, right? So you, can't, you often can't make the model safe, right? So the model may make mistakes and we kind of need to accept this. We make the system safe and similar from a security perspective. Uh, robustness goes into this direction. So you can make a system more robust by making it less sensible to noise. Um, actually, let me go there and then also answer Jack's, uh, Jake's question in a second. So 
Um, there are a ton of metrics that we care about. I think we covered most of what I have on this slide. Um, there's maybe a few variations of what we talked about, like inference time you can also care about because it's energy, how much energy you're consuming, it's typically correlated. Right, so if you're thinking IoT devices or mobile phones and you're running some big inference algorithms, you don't want to take too much energy. Um, training time also, how does training time scale with more or less data? Right, so do you pick an, so you have maybe a huge, huge data set, does your training algorithm scale with us, even if it would maybe work quite well for smaller data sets? Does it work with lots of features? Can it look at lot for lots of interactions between those features? Um, I think otherwise we probably mentioned most of us. How robust is it against kind of poor quality training data? Um, is it reproducible? If you learn it multiple times, are the results stable? Um, so there are a couple of, of properties along those lines. Um, just briefly, um, this may have, this may also come up in recitation tomorrow, but um, I use the term metric as some form of prescribed measurement, right? So something like requests per second, maximum memory in gigabytes uh, for each inference or something like this. So this is a metric or a measure. Some people distinguish between those ter two terms, I don't, so metric or measure. And then there's a way to operationalize a metric that is come up with a way of measuring this, right? So that somebody can measure something automatically or repeatedly or has a process of going out. So in, in the next homework assignment, we'll ask you to think about qualities, think about measures for those qualities or metrics, and then operationalize those. Amine? You have a question? Yeah. Yes, I have a question about reliability. Uh, my understanding, uh, reliability is uh, is, Windows, is when the system crashes, it should still continue working at right. a minimum. Yeah. And this is a must, I think, for, for, for safety critical systems like aviation. Yeah. But seeing that the system doesn't crash, I'm not sure if this is realistic or not. I'm not sure if this is part of, of reliability or not. Yeah, so, so I think reliability we care more about at the system level right so the entire system that we're building similar to safety right is it reliable if something in the system crashes um, can we continue operating i don't have the impression that there are any machine learning approaches where we're really worried about crashes at runtime um, at least during inference, right? So the inference mm -hmm. usually means like navigating through a decision tree or multiply, multiplying a few matrices, um, things like this, right? So potentially fairly large computations, but usually really well-defined. And we don't usually test the inference part much because we really understand well how it works. Right? So I haven't seen any discussions where people are really worried about the reliability of the machine learning component itself. Um, what you're usually worried about is that the model makes wrong predictions and because of this, the entire system is not reliable. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, also, there's no standard term for how to call those things as far as I know. I've seen model properties in the machine learning literature um, when referring to those qualities. Uh, attributes are sometimes used. Um, I prefer just the term quality or quality attributes, maybe non-functional requirements. Um, just to be aware, again, if you kind of have interdisciplinary teams, make sure that you define what you're talking about. So let's talk about three metrics. Um, I want to talk about interpretability, robustness, and fairness. We will have a, at least one lecture for each of them later. I just want to introduce them briefly and give you an intuition. Right, so interpretability is there to answer the question, why did a model predict something? Right, so if we have the model that makes a recommendation a credit rating, it gives you a credit score of 600. You want to be able to answer the question, why did I get 600, right? So maybe different questions of how would I have gotten a higher score or lower score? Um, 
how is this prediction different from this other person's prediction? A lot of machine learning models give you an answer, but you have a very hard time understanding why you get to a specific answer. Right, so there are a couple of scenarios where you want to explain predictions. Examples are like, you make a decision automatically, like you automatically decline a credit card application, and now you need to justify it. There are actually attempts to standardize this and require this by law. The, like, um, I think some steps in the European unions uh, for a right to an explanation. If a system kind of takes an automated action, um, for example, declines um, your credit card application, you, you are required to be able to get an um, explanation. Um, this is a massive research field in um, machine learning these days. From our perspective, this is also super useful for debugging. Right, so we looked into kind of evaluating model accuracy. And if you get low results, you don't typically know why, right? So you can look at individual examples and you have a hard time figuring out why does it predict the wrong credit score for this person? Or even if you have fairness issues, like why does it uh, decline the credit card application for this woman, woman even though it has pre precisely the same criteria as this other person here, right? Um, so whenever we want to understand something, kind of explainability, interpretability are kind of important concepts, right? So some models are inherently easy to understand. So the model that I've shown here, that I've actually shown you a few times, is a really simple decision tree, right? It's a decision tree with very few decisions that I can look at and I can understand what this model does, right? If it predicts an arrest, I can figure out why does it predict this, right? It predicts because I'm in this age range and I, it has these prior offenses. I don't necessarily have to agree with the parameters of these models, right? The cutoff scores, um, but I can understand what the cutoff scores were, right? I can explain to somebody, this is why this decision happened and the model was based on training data. So with these cutoff scores, this is maybe the most representative. If you, have a, if you train a deep neural network with a couple million parameters, you have no way of understanding what happens there. Even if you have decision trees that are really deep, right? Lots of if else decisions, you can kind of follow this, but really understanding becomes hard, right? So very small models can be still understood. And sometimes people talk about inherently easy to understand. For more complicated models, people try to find explanations. So there's a lot of work on um, figuring out, I made this prediction, what other inputs would have led to a different prediction? Or in this region, I would have gotten a better credit score if you had um, more money in the bank right now or something like this. Right? So we're going to talk about this much more. There are a bunch of approaches that try to explain things after the fact. Those predictions don't necessarily need to be very faithful um, to the model, right? It's kind of a local approximation. Um, just intuitively, if you had to judge a model to be interpretable or not, how would you measure this? Any idea how you could do this? The number of parameters is probably a reasonable first explanation, um, approximation, right? So um, not sure if you have 10 neurons that you still really understand what's happening, right? It's harder to interpret neuron activation just in general probably than, um, than kind of decision trees, but the size of the model, right? The number of parameters, the number of decisions um, is, one is one, right? Complexity of the model kind of just puts it back to me asking, how do you measure complexity? You wanna? Like for example, in the deep neural network, uh, if there are so many layers, it might be hard to explain. But if you're only having a one layer fully connected, uh, then it's just, 
uh, just like linear regression, which is pretty explainable, right? Yeah, linear regression plus cutoff, yeah. Um, yeah, which I think in the end comes back to number of parameters, but I think what you're hinting at is also one layer um, with 10 parameters might be more understandable than two layers with five parameters each, right? Um, something like this, yeah. Um, think about not things that you can measure automatically. Um, if, you, if you can ask humans, so not a cheap evaluation, but you can, can do more things. Um, how could you measure interpretability then? One thing that researchers have done is show a model to a human and then ask them, ask the human to, to come up with a prediction. So essentially I show you this model of recidivism and I tell you now I have a person of 20 years with no prior offenses, should we predict them or not? And I see whether they kind of make the same prediction as the model does. Right? So kind of whether somebody can understand the model and make the same prediction uh, is one possible way that you can measure if you run a controlled experiment. You can also ask essentially the question, why did the model uh, do something? And then see whether a human can kind of come up with an explanation or you can ask, I get the prediction that somebody would be arrested. What different, what change would I need to do? What the credit card needs was declined. What change do I need to do um, to get approved, for example, right? And see whether a human can predict this. Vivek? Yeah, uh, one question that I had is, can the explaini explainability can be, exp like, can be told in terms of the examples that the model has seen before? So. It all depends upon the data that we have given to the model. So if it can trace back and tells us these are the things why I am predicting in, in this particular favor, can that particular thing explain? Yeah, I think you can do something like you're similar to this example in the training data. Um, although it doesn't really tell you what rules the model picks up on, right? So if you do K nearest neighbor, uh, we talk about this in a second as a as a model. Then that's the obvious explanation. You're similar to other people. So we spend at least one full lecture on this because I think this is also one really useful topic to figure out to debug models. Um, we do this in the second half of the lecture, though, um, as one of the more specialized topics. Another topic that people that there's a lot of research in trying how to measure this is robustness. Robustness is um, if I, how stable is a prediction of the model if I make tiny changes to the input, right? So the, the typical examples are something like the image above there where you have a picture, the model recognizes this, and then you, this is often adversarial learning, and then you make add tiny noise to this picture, right? So you make some pixels brighter, some pixels darker. It's in the realm that humans can't even distinguish those two pictures, right? And the model will figure out, make, makes a very different prediction, right? So one way of thinking about robustness is do two similar inputs usually provide the same output, right? Are the predictions of the model robust to tiny modifications? This will clearly not work for all inputs because the model needs to make a prediction, makes a distinction between cases. There needs to be an image somewhere that's really close to the line, right? Where a tiny change sh uh, shifts between the outcomes. There always needs to be one because we make this distinction, right? But what you typically look around, look for is that most of the time the model is stable, right? So predictions around the same input data is stable or predictions around training data is stable, right? So that we can't fool the model with something that's close to training data. Any idea how we could measure this? And again, we're, we're spending a whole lecture on this probably. The whole zoo of different techniques. Um, Daniel, you want to say something? Oh, yeah, I was just gonna say, couldn't couldn't you do 
exactly what you were saying. Make small modifications and see what the difference in prediction is. Yeah, you could probably just run experiments, do lots of small modifications and see how often do you flip the outcome. Yeah. Right? Um, the more efficient approaches are typically making targeted modifications. So there are a couple of adversarial techniques that specifically look for inputs. This is how these things are generated. Right? So you, you're trying for the smallest modification that turns a, a panda into a gibbon and search for this very specifically rather than randomly. Um, you can also see, yeah, similar to what, what Jake is saying, like how big are the bubbles around the training data or um, how far can I go before my model seems to more frequently randomly split, right? Um, questions like this. All right, and last one, fairness. Um, at the high level, the question is, does a model perform differently for different populations? And different populations are typically protected demographics like gender, race, uh, marriage status, and so on, right? Where you want to make sure that the model doesn't predict something based on those protected attributes that are leading to discrimination, right? So there, there's a whole zoo around why you want to do this. You might just be careful about this because you're a good person, but also because there's a big legal framework and there's laws against discrimination, right? And you, you might get sued and things like this. It's really hard to define um, fairness. There are many, many different notions of fairness. There's actually a lot of different ways of measuring fairness and they're not all compatible. They're actually often mutually exclusive um, one simple way of measuring fairness is, um, is the accuracy rate that you're getting, um, like the rate of true positives or the false negative rate, is this equal across both groups, right? So if I want to predict whether somebody gets, um, gets um, arrested in the future again, I can have a model that doesn't look at gender at all. So this model looks at gender, right? It makes different predictions for men and women. And you can argue that this is unfair. Their legal or their, their views why this is unfair. And you can measure this. How, how sensitive is my model to flipping this, right? So if a model is perfectly fair and never looks at gender in that sense, you could just randomly test it. It's one of those invariants that we talked about a week ago, where you can just take every data point, you flip the gender and you expect the output to be the same. A more useful metric is typically looking at, if I make a prediction, so there's lots of studies that um, men are actually more likely to be arrested again than women. We can talk separately about why that is, but if that's actually the case, then not looking at the history, of not looking at the gender might actually get to unfair outcomes because you're predicting this uh, re-arrests at the same rate, even though women are actually on average less likely to offend again. Right, so you can make a case here that to be fair, you want the model to be equally precise for men and women, right? So for example, you could train two separate models, one for men and one for women, and you want similar accuracy from both models, right? Similar um, precision rates, similar recall rates, for example. The models might be different. They might be using different features. They might use, um, they might differentiate on gender, but that might be fair still. And so it really depends on different forms of fairness. And I can't do this justice now in five minutes. So I just wanted to mention this. Um, there are many different notions. There are a lot of different measures. And it really depends on what you're doing. This is actually in the requirements engineering paper that you read for this lecture, right? Um, they, they were talking about this, that um, when you, when you pick a model, you need to figure out, or when you're building a system, you need to figure out legal requirements for fairness, um, goals for fairness, 
and then map this to specific requirements for the model and the system. We're again spending at least one lecture on this entirely, just on different notions of fairness and how you, how you can measure this, which is actually probably going to be the lecture where we use statistics and math the most, because we actually need to look at some of those measures and so, some of those formulas. Um, Right, so this is something that you really need to worry about in requirements early and think about what kind of fairness you worry about. Any questions briefly? I don't want to spend too much time on this part. All right, so I guess what I've tried to show you here is that there are lots of qualities that we might care about. And we kind of really want to figure out if we are setting, if we're doing requirements engineering, we kind of need to set minimum expectations or constraints for some of these, right? So for example, training time must finish within a week. Inference time must finish in one fiftieth of a second or something like this, right? Some of those things like security, privacy requirements, fairness concerns are much harder to identify and you probably need to look at the system perspective. It's harder to map uh, back to the model. Um, you also need to understand how much data do you actually have and so on. So there's a lot of work here to involve requirements engineers actually. My impression, this is one of the understudied fields to really think about how does requirements engineering change? Um, what's the role of a requirements engineer here? Um, but you really, in the end, for this lecture, what I care about is mapping kind of system level goals to goals that I have for the uh, machine learning components and then establish constraints, establish goals here. So I wanna race through some of the common machine learning approaches and just talk a little bit about requirements, uh, about properties here. Right? So there, there are a bunch of, there are so many different approaches. So this thing here is actually, um, this is a map uh, um, in scikit-learn that essentially describes the decision tree. If you have this much data and this kind of problem, maybe use this kind of tool. Um, this is a rough approximation. Uh, the link here, I have this somewhere later. Yeah. Um, this is not the part that I actually wanted to show. I wanted to go through some of these approaches and just talk about with regard to all the qualities that we looked at so far, what kind of qualities is this kind of learning approach probably good for, which is it less suitable for? So let's actually start with one that we spent quite some time on earlier, right? So if we're building decision trees, which of all these qualities are decision trees great at? Which are they performing not so great at? Explainability is good if the decision trees are small. It becomes really terrible to understand if they get big, but small trees um, have, are easy to explain. They're very intuitive. Um, model size is also something, if you don't have too many parameters, if you can characterize the smaller models, we have very small models that are easy to understand. Um, they are not super expensive to train most of the time. Um, inference time is easy, right? It's a few decisions to go down the tree. How's accuracy? Accuracy is actually kind of a weird thing to compare. Um, it depends so much on the data and the problem. And it's actually um, a lot of researchers claim that for most problems, most machine learning approaches perform with similar accuracy. There are some problems where some perform much better. Um, and it's kind of hard to do certain problems with certain approaches. But for the most part, um, especially for kind of standard problems, you often get kind of similar accuracy. Um, so decision trees are probably not great for image classification. Any idea why? Hmm. 
Right, uh, decision trees don't handle huge numbers of features well, right? So you have just too many decisions that you need to try in the learning process. Um, they, they don't, they're not super great at learning high abstractions, um, maybe better for discrete data, right? They tend to overfit um, and things and kind of just with a huge number of features, uh, they're not great. What Daniel wrote, I think before is also, it's more related to incremental learning. I don't know whether there are advances, but default decision trees need to look at all, datas to, all data to decide where to make decisions. Um, right, so if you have a little bit extra data, it's kind of hard to incrementally retrain the model. Um, right, so um, linear regression is an approach where you essentially learn a formula um, where you have a bunch of features and you multiply each feature with the learned parameters and you, and you add them all. Right? And there are a bunch of ways to kind of use this in different ways, SVNs and uh, support vector machines and stuff like this. Um, so it can only learn linear relationships. So it's bad at things that require nonlinear relationships. You can encode some interactions, um, but it's not super obvious. What are other advantages, disadvantages of linear models? Accuracy is not good if the model is not linear, right? Um, the models are typically fairly small. If you have too many features, these things become very hard to train. Um, if they are small enough, they are easy to understand. Humans are pretty good at kind of just multiplying factors and adding these numbers together, right? Um, some disadvantages. Do you have anything obvious? Yeah, number of features, um, nonlinear interactions. Um, you can't retrain them incrementally either, I think. Right, so you learn on all data at once. Um, you have to have weird encodings if you have um, categorical data sets, right? You need to think about how to encode this as factors. All right. All right. Um, Neural networks, I think this is a more obvious contrast. Advantages, disadvantages? Takes forever to train, right? Um, needs a lot of training data also. The model is very big. The model is pretty much impossible to understand. This is all bad. What what is this good for? Accuracy, yes, but also lots of other things can be accurate, right? If you have lots of features, right? Or you don't want to do feature engineering, kind of you skip the kind of put raw data in. Um, deep neural networks can handle large, large feature sets and nonlinear interactions uh, much better, right? So they might pick up on all kinds of things, complex functions, complex boundaries, um, right? Not just linear functions. All right, um, one last one. We haven't talked about this before, Ken nearest neighbor. Can somebody explain how this works? I assume a bunch of you have done this in some class and implemented this maybe. Would somebody volunteer? Greg? Yeah, so um, this model actually doesn't have any, um, any parameters itself. It's only comparing your input to um, the samples that are already contained within. So you have just the hyperparameter K, um, which tells you how many nearest neighbors to, fet to fetch. 
and um, then you would have some kind of distance metric, typically the Euclidean distance that would compute um, what the closest known samples are to that sample. And then based on some kind of consensus, like a majority, um, it gives you your label based on what the previous um, examples have been labeled as. Yep. So it, it's lazily essentially searching when you have a data set, what's the nearest neighbor? So what is this most similar to? And then you classify it the same way. Okay. Um, what, what's a good, what is this good and bad for? Training size is amazing, right? You have no training. The model size is perfect. No model. Incremental learning, yeah. Because you're not really learning, you just, if the data changes all the time, right, you can do this. Explainability to some degree, right? So you just find nearby things. Um, it becomes, it may become very slow if you have large data sets, right? So you, you have the cost of, it, the inference is more expensive because you search at inference time. Um, right, I think also it doesn't handle huge numbers of features well, so you need to, you need a similarity function. You need to figure out how similar things are needed an ability to search in an area around something, right? So this doesn't scale very well. Um, there's some bad cases, yes, um, may not be super robust um, depending on your problem, right? Um, so what I hope you've been seeing so far is that we, we can look at a bunch of approaches and we can already kind of get a mental model. Some learning techniques usually are better at certain qualities than others, right? So whenever we have a problem, we need to figure out what are the qualities that we care about? What are maybe trade-offs? Um, what are constraints? So what are things that are hard requirements? Um, so I'm not sure I would use K nearest neighbor in a real time situation, right? Because the inference time is less predictable. Um, so in the end, you really need to figure out if I have a certain problem, what kind of method am I using? And most, a lot of times is kind of obvious. There's often the state of the art or we're using deep learning because everybody's using this now. But often what you want to think about is really what are really the requirements that I have, right? What are really the qualities? And often it might be worse to actually go out and measure this. This is actually what I'm going to make you do in the next homework assignment. I just released this. Um, where I'm going to ask you to do what you just did in the last homework assignment two more times but with different learning techniques and then actually measure a bunch of qualities that you care about, right? So if you're using deep neural networks instead of whatever you used just now, how big would the model be? Do you get similar accuracy? What's the inference time? Right? How many predictions per second can you do? Right? Um, by the way, I mentioned this briefly after class. Um, I have a pandemic related um, teamwork component in this one. So if you want, I want you to encourage to work together a little bit that you're not entirely isolated at home. So if you want, you can pick a partner for this assignment. You don't have to, you can. Um, the only requirement is that you work with somebody that you haven't worked before with. Right? So I don't want all the MSE students just to cluster together and work with people that they are on the team on anyway. I heard that two people here in the class are roommates also, please don't work together, right? But otherwise, if you want, it's completely optional, but um, feel free to work together with somebody and submit things together or submit things separately um, if this helps you to, to talk to somebody and get connected with somebody. All right, so... Um, let me just briefly see. So I'm going to speed through this to, to cover one more thing. Um, so we could have done some quizzes now to figure out which technique might be more suitable for certain kinds of problems. So for lane detection, maybe not deep neural networks. Um, 
but probably actually some much older techniques, maybe deep neural networks as well. So you can kind of think about trade-offs. For credit card scoring, maybe something that's more interpretable, some smaller, simpler models might be better than having something that's completely a black box. Uh, for movie predictions, something where you constantly get new data, something like k-nearest neighbor might be better, where you don't actually need to pre-train a model, right? The data changes all the time. Um, maybe not, right? So you can, you can have these kind of discussions here. Um, and in the end, there are trade-offs. So you have a bunch of techniques that have pros and cons, and you really need to figure out what are the qualities that you care about and what are the trade-offs that you care about. So there's this interesting example from the Netflix prize, which was about recommending movies at Netflix better, right? Um, and there were lots of techniques that outperformed what Netflix was doing and somebody won and there's this big competition and somebody got money for winning this competition. But in the end, they decided not to implement any of this because the complexity of implementing this and the cost of running this uh, was not was so high that it wasn't worth it in a production environment. So they actually stuck with something that was simpler, slightly lower accuracy, but much easier to operate, right? Smaller models, maybe easier to debug and so on. So in the end, you have all these trade-offs um, and you kind of need to figure out, there are, there are some solutions that are obviously bad, right? So if a solution is better, then another one on every single dimension you call dominated, then you clearly don't want to look at the bad solution. But typically you have some sort, which typically called the Pareto front. So solutions that are better on one dimensions and worse on another dimension. And it really depends on your trade-off decision, which one of those you're picking, right? So if you evaluate a bunch of solutions, you can figure out which are the ones that are competitive. And then there's a judgment decision, which one you actually want to use. Um, Right, so since I have like 15 minutes left, I wanna do something that I wanted to do actually about six lectures ago. I wanted to talk about kind of classic symbolic AI strategies. And I just wanna cover this to give you one more contrast about things that other sort of AI solutions might look like. So this is not machine learning. This is symbolic reasoning most of the time. Right, so classic symbolic reasoning um, the most basic and well-known example is Boolean satisfiability. You have a formula like this, and you want to know, is there any possible assignment to A, B, and C, right? They can be true or false, that this entire formula is true. So in this example, is there any assignment to A, B, C that this formula is true? So we have a conjunction of multiple terms. So we already know B is definitely false, right? Otherwise there can't be a solution. If B is false, then A needs to be true. Otherwise there can't be a solution. If A needs to be true, C needs to be true. So A not B, C would be a solution here, right? And there has been a huge amount of research on finding, this is an NP complete problem. This is really hard to solve. You would need to, if you, if you don't have a good strategy. And there's a huge amount of research in the AI community on finding good solutions, finding these things efficiently. And set solvers, so tools that solve these kind of problems have gone amazingly well in the last couple of 20 years or so um, that we can actually, even though the problem is NP hard, we use set solvers in all kinds of problems these days. Right. You can actually automatically reason about really big complicated formulas. Um, so one example that I've been working on in the past, and I have never thought of this really as AI or machine learning, no, it's not machine learning, but AI is kind of config configuration systems. So the traditional thing is like cars are highly configurable. If you buy pretty much any car these days, you click to all these configuration dialogue and you select some features here. And if you select this, you can't have another one. Um, the example that I've been working on a lot is the Linux kernel it has about 14,000 configuration options at compile time, that's just in the kernel. Most of these are drivers. And a lot of these have dependencies, right? So you have a bunch of these options that you can check. Internally, they have the language where they define um, the options. So they have 
They have this option, it's a Boolean option, it's off by default, they have a different option here, and it depends on some other options, one or the other, and if you select one, this one, then you select another one, if you do another one, and so on, right? So you have fairly complicated dependencies here, and you want to reason about them in different ways, and that's something that solvers, AI solvers, set solvers can do pretty well these days. But you typically do some encoding. So you encode a, whatever problem you have as a Boolean satisfiability problem. So the tool that we have is answering questions like what I started with, is there any satisfiable assignment to this? Right, and now you can encode things. Um, so here's an example. Um, if we have this part from the Linux variability model here, I can encode this as a propositional formula. The first thing is I say, for this depends clause, I'm saying, if memory hot plug-in is enabled, then either sparse memory or ACPI NUMA needs to be enabled, right? I, I, I express this as a propositional formula and I can check whether that holds in every single configuration. In fact, what I'm asking technically is, um, let me see. I'm asking um, whether uh, I have a tautology of this formula here and asking whether, so whether this holds in all cases, right? So whenever memory pl hot plug is on, then one of the other things needs to be on. And actually checking that something is a tautology can be encoded as a satisfiability problem. Does somebody happen to know how? I negate the formula and I see whether that thing is satisfiable. If there's no solution for the negation, then it needs to hold true for all the original values. I'm going fast here, but does this roughly make sense? Right, so what I'm doing here is I have some sort of formula or some sort of problems. I encode this as a propositional formula. I encode this as a satisfiability check, and then I can give it to a tool which can solve this for amazingly large problems. And there are a couple of things that I can do with this. Um, one thing that people have done for the Linux kernel is figuring out, are there any features, any options that can never be selected because of constraints? And what you're doing is you're taking, you're taking the entire model of the Linux kernel, oops, um, so all possible configurations kind of create a massive formula that includes all the possible, describes all the possible constraints. And then you ch check whether with those constraints, can an option O still be activated? And if there's no possible assignment, you've found this problem here that there's no possible way that I can ever activate this formula. Does this roughly make sense? Right, so I'm encoding the search for among all the possible configurations, is there ever an option that I can't activate as a problem that I can delegate to a solver? And even though I have 14,000 configuration options and massive constraints, actually the, the version of the Linux model uh, that has all of these things in a very compressed format is um, it's about 14 megabytes, I think. Has, oh, I don't remember this, multiple million clauses in kind of conjunctive normal form. So this is a massive formula. It takes the set server about one second to reason about this. Right, so it's fairly efficient. Um, I can also check, are there any options that need to be always included in every single configuration? So I'm always just saying, if the configuration is valid, so if it adheres to all constraints, does it imply that this option is always selected? If that's a tautology, then this is a mandatory option. Maybe I shouldn't include a configuration option. Some of my colleagues call it these undead options. Right, they're like zombie features, they're always there. Um, and again, I can check tautology through not the negation, and these are just transformations. So 
So for mutually exclusive options, any idea how you would encode this? Are there any two options that can never be included together? You can do something like in all post, is there ever a valid configuration? So it's valid across to all constraints where A and B are together, right? If they can be together, then they are clearly not mutually exclusive. So you're just negating this um, and can encode this as a satisfiable problem. Does it make sense? I don't wanna go too deep into this. What I want to get away here is that there's some automation about how you can reason about this. A standard example also where this may be used is uh, job scheduling. So um, I tried to take this out of a textbook where you have a task of assembling a car, like put on one tire, put on the other tire, put on the roof or a door or something like this. And there's certain things that, you can ha that can happen in parallel and certain things that ha need to happen sequentially. So a way to encode this is that you have a bunch of variables and you just say each variable is a time when this activity starts. And then you say the last activity needs to start at the 30th minute. Or, and then you have constraints like sec uh, the second task needs to start after the first task and the first task takes 10 minutes, right? So the first task starts at some point, 10 minutes later is when the second task can start. So this is again adding a bunch of constraints this is not just Boolean, right? So this is not just true and false. We are reasoning about numbers here. This is called a constraint satisfaction problem. We have a bunch of solvers that can deal with this. Again, it's not Boolean formulas, but kind of constraints. And then again, again, we try to find, is there any valid assignment to the way that we can start these things that we can finish the car in 30 minutes? There are also solvers that will solve minimization problem. So or maximization problems. So try to find me the assignment where the largest, where the latest task starts as early as possible, something like this. The reason why I'm talking about this, this isn't using machine learning. This is not training on data. This is reasoning about complex relationships. It may take a very long time to solve these things, in some cases, this is NP-hard, so it may never terminate. But in a lot of cases, we have solvers that can solve this. And if we get a solution, then we know that the solution is optimal or correct, right? So a set solver will never give us an assignment for a formula that's not actually a fulfilling assignment, right? A, CST, a CSP solver will never give us a solution to this problem that's actually not fulfilling all the constraints. And if we're minimizing something, it will give us the optimal solution as well. So here, why I'm bringing this up is there are lots of symbolic AI techniques where you can encode a lot of problems as some logic reasoning. This is actually deductive reasoning. We have specifications. This is not the inductive machine learning reasoning. Right, so we provide rules and the machine will reason for us following those rules and it provides an accurate answer. If we get any answer, it might time out. Right? These problems are decidable, but they're NP complete. Right? So we might not wait long enough for an answer. We would get one eventually. Um, but if we get one, we know that it's accurate. We can rely on this. The Linux kind of doesn't actually use a SAT solver inside. They use some heuristics and you might get into problems. Um, they discuss this, but they, they don't want to adopt this for the extra complexity, um, but it scales pretty well. Um, um, this is more or less easy to understand depending on how, how close your encoding is. Um, and modern solvers are pretty good for many problems. 
this is used for all kinds of things in AI, right? So AI is more than machine learning. This is actually what I wanted to cover originally. There are many problem uh, planning problems, scheduling problems, where you can find in complex problems with lots of constraints, precise solutions. Planning data center layouts and minimizing cable lengths, this kind of problem, right? Or optimizing big data queries. Um, these are often constraints satisfaction problems, or you can encode them. In software analysis is used a lot for static analysis, verification, um, um, version resolution, dependency management, uh, chip design, things like this. And also kind of electronic trading agents and e-auctions. So there are lots of application scenarios that are not just machine learning. There are combinations with machine learning and then you again lose kind of guarantees. The key point that I want to make here is that AI, in general, there are approaches that can give you guarantees if they terminate, right? So you don't typically have a good timing predictions, how long it will take. And then there was one more step that I want to bring up. I'll try to race through this in three minutes. There's probabilistic programming is, um, think of this as symbolic reasoning with probabilities. So you write programs that look almost like programs, but they describe probabilities. For example, you have the event of a burglary with a certain probability. So you program a coin that is true in 1% of all cases, and then you program the probability of an earthquake, and then you can reason about if I have a combination, if I see true for both events, I have yet another probability and so on. Right? So you can create really complicated networks of probabilities, kind of how events react to other events. And in the end, you can ask, how big is the probability that there's actually a burglary if there's an alarm, for example? Does this make sense? If you know statistic reasoning, kind of Bayesian reasoning and so on, you could compute this kind of stuff by hand. And this, but the advantage of writing these programs similar to the set server is that you can write very, very big programs. You hard code all the rules, they're all probabilities. And in the end, you can, get some, you can get some results that tell you the probability of certain results. And these are accurate, right? So the, again, these are not approximations. Daniel? Is, it, is there stuff done where ML will determine the probabilities for you? Like doing, uh, I don't know, something simple as like a linear regression to give you a, a weight for your probability or something? So you need to figure out where you get your probabilities from. So you can estimate them or you can use whatever statistics you want on some data, whether you want to call this machine learning or just basic statistics or just exploratory data analysis, right? There are also lots of uh, combinations of machine learning and probabilistic reasoning. Okay. Uh, let me just kind of race through this a little bit more. The, um, the thing here is that we can give optimal answers under uncertainty, right? So it's not guaranteed to be the thing that you expect, but it's the most probable thing and not just by guessing, right? Not just by observing something. What you have is you reason about uncertainty at massive scale. You can have massive simulations with lots of probabilities and lots of rules about events. Um, there is a step called probabilistic inference. So this is actually solving the problem in the end, right? So you have this big thing and you want to know what's the probability of a certain event or what's the most likely event to outcome. And this can actually be solved. There are a bunch of different techniques to do this. You can do this symbolically. You can also just simulate this, approximate this, kind of Monte Carlo simulations. Um, a gun, bunch of probabilistic model checkers give you guarantees with, with actually probability bounds, right? It will tell you this is the most likely outcome. This will have a probability of 70% or something like this. Um, we use this for some robotics thing. I don't want to, I don't have the time to talk about this. Again, the thing that I want to talk about here is you manually create models most of the time. You can represent uncertainty and you can reason about this. Again, we have specifications. We know how probabilities propagate. We can actually symbolically reason about this. Um, it's 
The inference problem is a really hard problem, similar to Boolean satisfiability, probably much harder. Um, and there are some combinations to sort inference better with machine learning. The whole reason why I'm bringing all of this up is that in this entire lecture here, um, we tend to focus on supervised machine learning. And I always say that we never have guarantees and mistakes can always happen. There are AI reasoning techniques that fall under the AI umbrella, right? Artificial intelligence that actually give you guarantees. Typically symbolic reasoning or symbolic AI, I would call them. They are not the most popular thing that everybody talks about, but they are out there. There are people researching this and they are useful for a lot of problems, right? So, um, yeah, wrong slide, also wrong slide. So all I wanted to do today is kind of talk about quality is multifaceted and we really need to figure out if we select a machine learning component or AI component, what are the qualities that we care about, right? Correctness and guarantees might be actually one of them. There are many qualities we might care about um, and some AI techniques are better on certain qualities than others, right? There's often a, a trade-off involved in picking the right one. And again, I'm gonna stop recording here and then I stick around for questions. Um.